Welcome to Living Mirrors, with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is Gay Hendricks. Gay is a psychologist, writer, and teacher in the field of personal growth. After completing his PhD at Stanford, he went on to become a professor of counseling psychology at the University of Colorado. With his wife, Kathleen, he founded the Hendricks Institute, which offers seminars and workshops on the topics that we discussed today. Gay has authored dozens of books by himself and with Kathleen, including Learning to Love Yourself, Conscious Breathing, Conscious Loving, The Big Leap, and most recently, The Genius Zone. Today, we talk about all these topics and more. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, I'm here with Gay Hendricks. Gay, thanks for being on the podcast. Great to be with you, James. Thank you for inviting me. Hey, you're very welcome. Um, I mean, you, you really are welcome because your your work's had a huge impact on on my life. Um, my wife first got me uh, this book, the Learn to Love Yourself workbook. Um, oh. And it was, yeah, really transformative. Uh, just everything you lay out is so kind of clear and powerful and simple in it, but in a way that's kind of really revolutionary. So I thought maybe we could begin there. Um, but also, I mean, I'm interested in the fact that you must you must hear things like this from thousands of people, like whose lives you've you've helped. And I guess I'm intrigued as to what that's like to have such an impact on people. Well, just as you say that, it brings tears to my eyes because it's the most wonderful thing in the world. I, uh, you know, I always say I live on a steady diet of miracles because every day when I open my inbox or look on Instagram or something, I get to hear that and I never get tired of it to me it fulfills the purpose of my life because I, I created the purpose of my life in my thirties, which was to expand every day in love, creativity, abundance, and, um, and to inspire other people to do the same thing. And so if I'm able to do that, I'm having a great day. Plus I want to make sure I'm doing it myself. And uh, so far so good. Katie and I are about to celebrate our 40th wedding anniversary in October. So uh, I've been able to apply just about everything I've learned. Uh, and you have to do that if you're going to stay married successfully for 40 years. Yeah, well, congratulations. And we'll get on to, uh, to that towards the end, I'm sure. Um, and so maybe we could begin with a bit about the, the kind of core ideas in learning to love yourself, because this idea of, of self-love is something that's really not widespread in our culture, I would say, which is why, to me, you, were, you know, this, this book was like a kind of shining light that just kind of showed me the way um, in my kind of own personal journey. Uh, maybe we could begin with your story of how you first discovered uh, this kind of revolutionary thing of self-love. One of the great days of my life, actually. Um, I had just, uh, now we'll time travel back to the year of 1974. You may not have even been born then, or just yeah. barely probably. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the locale was Green Mountain Falls, Colorado. I had just the year before finished up my PhD at Stanford and I'd gotten a new job as an assistant professor at the University of Colorado's branch, graduate school branch in Colorado Springs. And a week before the whole thing was to start when I was supposed to take my new job on, I was wandering around out in the woods near this cabin I'd rented in Colorado. And as I was wandering around, I realized I was feeling a lot of anxiety. And when I checked it out, what my anxiety was about in my body, I realized I felt like I didn't know anything. And you know, at Stanford, the PhD program and my master's program before, I had learned everything <laughs> about counseling psychology, but in a way I didn't know anything because I feel, felt like I didn't understand and know the central reason people get themselves stuck and the one way we can always get ourselves out of it. So that was what I was feeling the lack of in my training. In other words, I'd never really had a complete whole body experience of transforming something in myself or helping somebody else transform something instantaneously. I came from the background where you, you're you supposed to stay in therapy or keep the person in therapy for years at a time. You know, it's not about, but I thought something could, there must be something in human behavior that we can do that gets ourselves unstuck quickly. So that was my, my wondering. So 
I realized also that I had asked professors for these kinds of questions and asked therapists, but I'd never really just ask myself or ask the universe around me. And I was just beginning to understand metaphysically that we are the universe, that it's not us versus them, that we're made of the same stuff as everything else in the universe. And so that was kind of in the back of my mind too. So I asked the universe directly, I was standing out by a tree and I asked the universe, I said, what is the one thing that we keep doing wrong that gets ourselves stuck as human beings? And what is the one thing that we could do that would always reliably unstick us so that we could get back into the flow of intimacy or good feeling or whatever we desired? And so that was the question. And I asked it and I just kind of, I think for once in my life, just kind of sat back and waited for an answer and, and made myself open. There's an old saying that um, prayer is talking to God, meditation is listening. And so there I was in a moment of listening, uh, maybe like I'd never done before. And I was rewarded for it because I got this tremendous download of information in that moment. And what I got was that the one thing we do wrong is to keep ourselves at a distance from whatever we're experiencing. Like, you know, if, if you're feeling miserable and you walk into a grocery store and the clerk says, how are you today, Mr. Cook? And you say, I'm fine, right? I mean, you don't say, hey, you know, I've had the crappiest morning. Uh, Rebecca did this and then the kids did that and then the dog did that. And you know, about that time, the, the uh, clerk is gonna say, Stop, stop, too much information. So we keep a lot of things hidden inside ourselves. And the problem is, it's not just the, the, the clerk at the grocery store. I would say we've had 4,500 couples work with us here. And I would say the number one complaint that we hear, uh, particularly from women in the relationship, if it's a male-female relationship, is very frequently the woman will say, I just got tired of him never telling me how he really felt, you know, and I just can't stand that anymore. So one of the training things that we do is, is teach simple ways of identifying your emotions so that people don't have that complaint about you. But boy, in the beginning, I had that problem big time. I was very intellectual guy. I was, you know, you got to be pretty head smart to wend your way through a PhD at Stanford and deal with all the kind of stuff that goes along with that. Um, I always say that getting my doctorate was like, uh, you know, those Bobo the Clown things that kids have that you punch them and they go down and then they pop back up. And uh, getting the PhD in counseling psychology was, I think the, the main professor's job was to knock down the Bobo the Clown doll over and over again and see if you could get back up for you know, uh, 118 times and see if you could get back up to 119th. And uh, so, and there's a good value in that because you have to deal with a lot of extreme situations and they want to make sure you're prepared for that. But it was mostly intellectual kind of work. And I had never really cultivated a relationship with my own emotions inside. So in that moment, I got this download that the one thing we do is be unloving toward ourselves. We criticize ourselves, we shame ourselves, we go out of our way to talk about our problems. But how many people do you see sitting down at the pub talking about their successes? You know, it's just something that we don't do very much in life. So what I did in that moment was I decided to reverse it. I decided, okay, I've been unloving toward myself a thousand times, 10,000 times. I'm just gonna pause right now and love myself for everything I am and everything I'm not. <sighs> and so for a little while there, I don't know how long it took, a couple of minutes, I just kind of wandered around out in the forest there, loving all the things that I'd never loved about myself. I was overweight at the time, and so I loved my extra poundage, and I was 
I realized I was carrying around a lot of anger about some things that had happened in my life with the breakup of a relationship and some grief about that. And I'd never really actually love myself. I try to keep myself away from that kind of thing. Um, one of your almost countrymen, James Joyce, there's a great line in one of his books um, where he says, Mr. Duffy lived a short distance from his body. And in a way, that's the problem I'm talking about, that we kind of, by filtering everything through our minds, we kind of lift ourselves out of having to deal with things we're angry about, scared about, sad about. But those things won't stay hidden forever. Eventually, they're going to pour out in the middle of an argument or after a few beers, or they're, they're going to be outed in some way. And what I decided to do was love those things and, and get to the bottom of them by loving them rather than trying to shame them away or push them away. And so that's what I started doing in that moment. And the amazing things, um, I'm being a little long-winded here, but it's a, an important story. Stop me if I'm uh, no, no, going totally too, great. <laughs> too far. But I got rewarded for it the next day by an unusual thing that happened. I had just moved to Colorado from California, so I didn't have a private practice or anything like that set up. I'd literally only been there a few weeks. And I'd met at the faculty get acquainted party, the wife of one of my fellow faculty members, another psychologist in the department. And she called me the next day after I'd had this big experience and said, that she was having some issues come up and she'd really enjoyed talking to me at the party. And could she come over and process them? And, you know, she said, I'd be happy to pay you. And, all. and I said, no, no, come on over, you know, we'll talk about it and see what you need. And um, I didn't want to, you know, do a therapy session with her because it was kind of a dual relationship sort of thing since I knew her socially. But anyway, I told her I'd, I'd listen to whatever was going on with her. So she came over and she told me this amazing story about this anxiety, this kind of like crazy anxiety attack she was having because she thought her husband was having an affair for a long time, but she kept saying to him, you know, is something wrong? Are you having a, you know, and he kept stonewalling her saying, no, you're crazy, yo, you're crazy. But then it came out that he actually was. And so she went into this massive little spiral of betrayal. And also nobody likes being lied to, <laughs> you know, uh, and um, especially if the other person is making you feel crazy that you're suspecting something. And so it's an old story, but it happens over and over and over again in relationships, unfortunately. And so having had this experience the, fall, uh, the day before, instead of trying to talk her out of her anxiety or do a relaxation exercise or something like that that I'd learned in school, I invited her to simply love and experience her anxiety. Instead of trying to make it go away, I, I should have mentioned too, when she first came in, um, I don't know if people will be seeing the video of this, but she was almost like she was sitting on a hornet's nest. She was so anxious, she almost vibrating. And it was because I found out that she was trying to hold this anxiety at bay. And so I came along, having had the experience the day before, and I said, go ahead, let's just experience that together. Let's love it as it is. I don't find it unlovable in any way. And I don't want you to make it go away. I want you to just be with it. Because You've earned your anxiety, so let's not shame it or make it go away. And so she did that. And over the next 15 minutes, she just let herself feel it. And she was kind of vibrating and breathing deeply and everything. But the amazing thing that happened was after about 15 minutes, the energy subsided and she had this big smile on her face. Wow, she said. What happened? Was that some special technique you learned at Stanford? You know? <laughs> I was tempted to say yes, yes, dear, that was, you know, uh, but uh, no, I said that was you. You know, you were just feeling and being with rather than trying to make it go away, and you were loving what was there rather than trying to shame it away. 
that was a big moment for me because then I got to see the practical value of this experience that I just had the day before. So that's my um, uh, long-winded uh, story about the moment of first learning to love myself. I don't think I've ever had a moment in my life I, you know, that had the most lifetime impact because now when I work with a client, I've I think my students counted up that I'd seen something like 20,000 individual clients and about a thousand executives over the years. And I can't think of a single session that I've done that I haven't used the background wisdom of that moment uh, to steer me through it. Yeah, I mean, I think I've gotten a similar thing unfolded you know, through me reading your words in, in your book um, and then practicing it myself and yeah, in, I've, I've rarely experienced anything that powerful and I, I couldn't believe how, how powerful this, this method was. And also I was 29 when it happened. I think you were 29 as well when this happened. Yes. As a matter of yeah. fact, I was. Wow. I've seen, I've seen that in a few people that 20, I don't know if it's something about 30 approaching and it feels like a make or break moment in life, but I've seen a lot well, of people you know, transformation there. In developmental psychology, we say, your job in your 20s is to experiment, make a lot of mistakes, try out a lot of new things. In your 30s, you find your life. In your 40s, you build your life. In your 50s, you enjoy your life. Those are the priorities. And people in their 30s, you know, they're often busy finding their life and, you know, doing more of what's already working and trying to find out something that's their genius. And in your 40s, you're, you know, kind of established and beginning to really build the components. And so oftentimes until our 50s, we don't get around to saying, ah, you know, maybe I can relax a little bit. Of course, I know people in their 70s and 80s who haven't had that moment, you know, <laughs> of, ah, I have a couple of uh, billionaires that visit me once or twice a year, and uh, they're up in their 70s now, but they haven't lost a moment of that competitive edge yet. You know, they're still uh, now instead of playing Monopoly, they're playing Monopoly with real buildings and companies and things like that, but they still get the same amount of zest from it. <laughs> I think um, with the stories you gave, it was really excellent illustration of, of the core ideas of this, this practice of self-love, because I think when people first hear about the idea of, of self-love, they might think it's something where, you know, the mind is finding reasons to love yourself and you're, you're just saying to yourself, uh, you have this belief, you know, that I am worthy of love. But the way you write about it is that this, this almost meditative kind of very experiential beyond mind and truly unconditional, right? You mentioned about it, you described it, you know, almost being the same thing as acceptance, really feeling your feelings. And to me, that seems to fit with this unconditional um, approach you're taking to feeling whatever arises in consciousness. Yes, because one of my definitions of love has to do with space. A very important part of love is space. Love comes with physical sensations, you know, you could feel a warmth in your chest or, a, you know, a kind of a whole body feeling of attraction or something, but it's really about giving, the, giving yourself space to be all of who you are and giving the other person space to be all of who they are. That's to me a wonderful form of love because if you're not giving the other person space to be who they are, you're trying to control them or shape them or sculpt them in some way. And that's dreadfully unfair to the other person, but it's really unfair to yourself because you don't have the possibility then of their creative unfoldment because you're caught inside your control programming. That's one of the things the new book is about, James, is about how to gently and benignly let go of that control so that the actual juicy stuff of this moment can appear. And to me, like, you know, I ask people all the time, and I'll just ask you, think of, think of someone you know for sure you love, Rebecca, or whoever you think of. Just think of that person that you know absolutely in your mind, nobody could talk you out of loving them. You just love them. Okay, I think of my wife, Kathleen, also known as Katie. Uh, I think of my daughter, Amanda, I, other people, friends in my life. 
And nobody in the world could talk me out of loving them. I love them. I just do. Now, here's the thing. Feel that same feeling toward yourself. It's as simple as that because you already are wired knowing how to love another person. Let's just make sure we give ourselves the same benign bath in love that we're giving other people. Yeah, I think that, you know, when I think there is this taboo around around self-love, uh, I think in large part because of what you said about um, people kind of are afraid that, you know, try and control people. And if someone's out there feeling all their feelings and uh, feeling all the benefit that comes with that, maybe they'll be help- <laughs> maybe they'll be encouraged to do that as well. And that's, it's kind of scary, right? Um, to feel your feelings in that way. Uh, but, but there's this taboo and it's, um, it seems that people kind of, I think would think of this maybe narcissistic or egoic, you know, that you're loving your identity, but it, it really seems to me that, that it's, as you were kind of pointing to there, this, this spacious, compassion that is there beyond the rational mind where the kind of if if you get out of your head if you get out of your feeling of yourself and you look at well that person obviously deserves compassion that person that person but most of us when we get to ourselves we say well i don't (laughs) for some reason i i don't but it's it's kind of getting outside of yourself and having that unbounded compassion for everyone i would you know i would say yeah well i always tell people you know, the big leap was a lot about how to discover your own genius, your own thing that you're uniquely suited to do. And the new book is about how to live in that space. And the two kind of go together. In fact, the new book, The Genius Zone, is I think of it as a sequel to uh, the work was in The Big Leap, because The Big Leap was about how to overcome what I call the upper limit problem, your tendency to sabotage yourself when things start going well. And once you start moving through your upper limit problem, then the next job is to really start owning and celebrating your genius and learning in the new book how to live there all the time. And I always tell people you're only one thought away from contacting your genius. And that thought is simply, I'm willing to have more of my genius revealed every day. You know, that's a simple, clear, positive thought that will get the juices flowing. Willingness is the first step, I think, to actually making a commitment to something. Before you make a commitment to your genius, that's, I I ask people to do that too. But before that, they have to just be willing that they may have some kind of genius down there. And if you'll take a stance of willingness to have that reveal to yourself, that opens up the space for that to come forth in life in one way or the other. I also think that it's important to make a commitment to your genius. And when people come here, uh, we do these uh, intensive days for uh, executives where like uh, a corporation might send their CEO and it's a $25,000 thing for the day where they, we work with only that one person all day long. And so they come out the other end looking real different when they came in at eight o'clock that morning. And uh, so, um, and that even includes an hour, hour and a half off for a walk and uh, lunch time. Um, but one of the first things we have them do is we have them go in a room by themselves for 10 minutes and just devote 10 minutes to their genius in the following way. The first thing we have them do is simply breathe, take easy, deep, peaceful breaths. And then once every 15 or 20 seconds, we have them ask, what do I love to do more than anything else? And then back to the breathing. Three easy breaths, then ask that question again. Hmm. We, we ask them to ask it with a, a wonder. Hmm. Hmm. What do I love to do more than anything else? And then as the day proceeds, we introduce more deeper wonder questions like, what do I do that produces the greatest possible results per time spent? And that's another genius question because it homes you in on what are the most essential processes that give rise to your deepest creativity. So what I'm getting at here is that you're only just a thought away from establishing this contact with genius. I say 
take that step, take that big leap, go ahead and have that thought, go ahead and say, yes, I'd be willing to have more of my genius manifest itself every day. Yeah, I'd be willing to have that and get a whole body agreement in yourself and watch what happens after that. Because, you know, I get to hear all the time, people give me positive reports, um, almost as almost too many to respond to, but I'm I'm very proud to say that I do my best to respond to every single fan letter that comes in or, or fan email and uh, always have. So um, sometimes I don't respond to them if it's something like, hey, I really loved your work. Would you summarize all your other books in less than 10 seconds, please? And then I say, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. But uh, so. Um, but one of the things that's important in my world is that stance of willingness, because that starts everything that opens the space. Willingness is one of the superpowers that human beings have that can really take us a long way. Right. And I think in learning to love yourself, you talk about it's not like you actually need to try to love yourself, but you need to be willing to love yourself. And then it kind of happens automatically. Yes, because if you're trying, you're coming from your ego, you're coming from your head. I'm looking for the kind of love that you feel in your body. You know, it's the kind of thing where you feel more space and openness and usually a, a pleasant vibration through your the cells of your body when you love yourself or love someone. There's that sense of ah, open space and there's also a warmth to it. Yeah, and it seems really surprising to me that, I mean, I would go as far as to say that it's so effortless. It really feels like the core nature of our mind. And it's it's astounding that we could be that lucky. <laughs> It is. We're very lucky. We're not to speak of uh, our luck in being only one of nine million species that can have a conversation about loving ourselves. That's that's right. a very luxurious place to be. That's right. a privilege. <laughs> well, and also, I mean, I think um, part of the reason your book was so powerful to me was was it felt like someone was giving me permission to love myself because there's so much kind of, you know, I do think culture in general tries to stop us from doing this and just having someone clearly knows what they were talking about um just very clearly explaining why it's okay <laughs> i think i i needed that permission which seems kind of crazy but I, I think i think our culture really does um try to keep a lid on this stuff you know so i, I was raised catholic and then there's a lot of guilt and shame and i can only kind of speculate that that must have been a kind of i don't know a way of keeping everyone if everyone's feeling guilty and shame they're quite disempowered they're not you know going to be a problem really going to be quite docile but uh well yeah, and uh, religion, religion has two big functions, I think, which is, you know, to give people a taste of the divine, a feeling of the divine. But also, if you look back into history, religion has the uh, awesome and unenviable task of organizing a bunch of crazy wild people, you know, and I think it was only in the 14th or 14th or 15th century, if you look back into the uh, uh, different communications from the popes. I had to do this in college. They had a whole thing we had to read on the, the different edicts of the popes over the year. And there was once a time back in the 14th century, I think, where the pope had to put out a message that said, you people have got to quit fornicating during mass because they were having problems in the back of the room. People would get carried away and uh, you know they hadn't seen each other all week, you know, and uh, and so uh, they didn't have the kind of restraints that we had. So it's taken now seven centuries of programming just to keep people from having sex in the back of the church. So uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of of, of 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 programming that has to go on in society to keep people moving from place to place in a civilized manner and that kind of thing. But it comes at a cost because then that we then transfer that and get get ourselves confused about well maybe nothing about myself is okay maybe everything is shameful uh, one of my colleagues um, now passed on John Bradshaw he wrote a couple of very big books back in the uh, 80s one called homecoming and one called Healing the Shame that Binds You. And he was telling me about, or maybe it's in one of his books, I can't remember, uh, about uh, when he was a little boy, when he was four years old and learning body parts, uh, he was in the living room. And he, he said, 
he points to his eye and says, this is my eye. And everybody goes, cheer. And he points to his mouth. This is my mouth. Everybody goes, cheer. And he starts to point to his penis. And everybody says, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, so even the labeling of it, it has a taboo associated with it. And uh, he came from one of those uh, staunch Catholic families too. In fact, I think he was in training to be a priest at one point before he got seduced by uh, mental health and uh, becoming a, a mental health professional. So, um, but uh, yes, the point is, uh, it's not just relative to any particular rhythm, um, any particular um, aspect or culture of life or any particular set of uh, religious rules or anything like, there is a tendency of the human mind, like Freud said, we have an id, an ego, and a superego. You know, we have that conscious, conscious way up there. By the way, if you look at the uh, construction of the human brain, it's about the size of a good sized grapefruit. Um, and it's organized roughly the same way in the sense that our modern cortex, the one that we're dealing with right now when we're talking to each other, is about the size of the rind of the grapefruit. But then the rest of the brain is that juicy stuff. What's down there? Well, there's our emotions down there. And that's where our, where our deep intentions live. And all of those things that are very important to life, but we don't get a lot of training in how to be with them. So, you know, it's, it's like your mind can get you up to into your 30s and maybe up to 40. But if you haven't started dealing with your emotions and learning how to be with them and love yourself, you're going to have problems in your 40s and 50s because you're dragging baggage that needs to be cleared up. See, the 30s, how old are you, by the way, if you don't mind my asking? Uh, 31 at the moment. Okay. Well, this is perfect. Your 30s are a lot about learning how to own all of yourself, learning how to own all of your emotions. In your 20s, you can get away a lot of times by repressing them, pushing them away, drinking them away, smoking them away, watching television. Um, now, I'm going to be glued to the television set myself this week to uh, see whether England can beat Denmark or not. I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the lone soccer fans way out here in California, so uh, uh, I don't have much uh, anybody to talk to. Um, but um, too much watching sports on TV, too much watching, uh, too much visual stimulation on the internet, those kinds of things can all keep us away from a rich, deep relationship with our bodies, especially three main feelings that cause most of the trip ups in life. Um, not being able to deal with your anger in a straightforward way. Um, a lot of us keep that well tucked inside or then explode with it in ways that cause problems. So here we teach people how to communicate all of your emotions, just like you would tell somebody the time of day. So we say we have people actually practice. It's 1020 and I'm angry. It's 1030 and I feel sad right now. It's 11 o'clock and I feel scared. It's 12.50 and I feel sexual feelings. So all of those kind of things are things that we need to be comfortable enough with to just talk about as ordinary things. And then you can talk about them when the time is right and it's the appropriate situation and not. They don't come out when you're not expecting it. And so... Um, Many of us live under kind of a thin veneer of repressing the things that matter most in relationships, like, like being able to tell somebody, I felt angry about that, or being able to tell somebody, I felt hurt about that, or I feel hurt right now, or I feel scared and I don't know why, or I feel some sexual feelings, or I feel confused. Those kinds of things are so important. And you know what, James, those are things that could easily be taught in the first grade of school, because I've seen them taught in the first grade. I've visited schools which have a very rich emotional awareness curriculum. Wow, it's amazing what these first, second, and third graders can do. I've actually watched a group of first graders practicing listening skills, where one person said something, and then the other person had to summarize what they said into a recorder, and then they played it back for everybody. I mean, it was just so cool 
to see first graders doing something that I sometimes beat my brains out with, with a 50 year old to try to, to get them to do. And it takes, you know, 10 months where it could have taken an hour of training in the first grade. So anyway, all glory to uh, schools that are beginning to develop more uh, emotional aware awareness in our kids. Yeah, and I think that point on um, on sexuality is particularly kind of, to me, it's very clarifying that of how kind of crazy our culture is or how these ideas are not in the mainstream of our culture because you write very beautifully about kind of the clear difference between sexual feeling and sexual expression where if you're responding to yourself with self-love, you the only thing to do is to accept your sexual feelings no matter what they are. And, but then, you know, if you don't do that, then you come from a place of resistance and you write about how you can kind of dramatize these things in your life. And then you get, that's a kind of unconscious dynamic. But if you're responding with awareness and compassionately towards whatever's true, you're being brought into alignment with facts about yourself. And then you're in a much better position to act more appropriate, you know, to act appropriately in the world. But instead we have this culture that, you know, I guess people have their own issues around these things. And so they're afraid you know, generation after generation, parents, try and suppress their child's sexuality so that they don't get triggered themselves. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really wish that this perspective was was more central in our in our culture. Yes, well, I'm doing everything I can and yeah. I'm glad you're putting out the word on it. <laughs> I've been talking about almost nothing else for the past 50 years, actually. Uh, I'm coming up on the 50th anniversary of all that happening. So it was really, uh, uh, the. Uh, time has flown by, but it's still the same message. I think human beings probably need to hear it more than ever these days. Right. And the just so we don't leave anyone behind if if on how to actually do this practice, um, you mentioned how it's kind of just experientially responding in this open, spacious, compassionate way towards whatever arises. Um, and it there's there's this amazing kind of short circuiting ability, um, the the way that you teach this approach, um, that it has because you write about how if you feel in the moment like you can't feel love for yourself well then love that that's the thing now yes. that you have to try and love and it's amazing how it can really eventually you start you start feeling this love even if you really think you can't i really appreciate you highlighting that because that's often the actual experience that we come to here is the person can't love themselves and so to open your heart and just love yourself for not being able to love yourself in that moment that is a major piece of work that happens right after that. Uh, people often go, ah, whoa, you know, <laughs> they've never done that before. Uh, I, by the way, I forgot to ask, are you a therapist or what is your background? So I trained in psychology as my undergrad, but now I'm a neuroscientist. So I do more kind of um, non-clinical research. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, we need more of that too. Human beings are very complex entities. Right. Yeah, and hopefully it has clinical relevance somewhere down the line. Um, but, uh, so, and then also, I guess when it comes to the, the nuances of, um, the practice of self-love, I mean, again, it's not like you're just summoning the nicest parts of yourself that are easiest to love, right? It kind of, it brings out the, the parts of yourself that are, you, you've relegated to the shadow that most need the love, right? So, so it feels, it feels like it really, um, it necessarily brings up this, whatever the thing is that, that you're going to find most difficult to love. One of my mentors, Jack Downing, who was a, a psychiatrist who uh, uh, practiced around Palo Alto when I was in my training back there, uh, he had this Im image that really uh, made a lot of sense. He said, most people think that there are two faucets in life. One is called pleasure and one is called pain. And he said that many people think, think that you can keep the pain one turned off and turn up the pleasure one. And he said, but in actual reality, there's only one faucet and it says awareness on it. And that you turn it on and in a way, then your job is to let go of trying to control what's there because trying to control what's there is what's made you miserable. The only way to get free is by opening up and loving what's there and, and bathing those things in consciousness and attention and love that you used to bathe in shame and uh, repression. Right. 
And when you've mentioned a couple of times that when people do this practice, there can be this kind of very embodied, you know, tremoring and, and kind of breathing. And another book that I found really um, powerful of yours is Conscious Breathing, where I, you know, I didn't realize my whole life that I was breathing in a kind of, I would say my breathing was almost traumatized, like kind of very shallow chest breathing. Um, and it was, it was through you that I learned to breathe naturally, breathe into my stomach. And um, so thank you for that. But I feel like it would be really, it might be worth explaining to, to people, I guess, how to yeah. breathe in a, in, a, in a natural way. Well, breathing is one of human beings' superpowers if we learn how to use it. Human beings have come from the factory with two different types of breathing wired into us. One is for relaxation where you're breathing, mostly your belly is moving with your breath. Uh, and then there's fight or flight breathing, which is designed to get you out of squeaky situations. And it's mostly done with a tightened belly and up in the upper chest. It's shorter, faster, shallower. It's designed for only a few minutes at a time. But I have people all the time that come in and they're already in that just from adapting to life. They've been used to their anxiety for so long that they're in fight or flight all the time. And so that's something that has to be fixed because if you keep doing that, your blood pressure goes up, your heart beats too fast. Uh, it's part of a whole syndrome of things. It's basically your body is stewing in fear all the time. And one symptom of that is short, shallow breathing. And so conscious breathing, uh, my book, Conscious Breathing, uh, they tell me that at one time, I don't know if it's still true, that it was the uh, world's best-selling breathing book. So uh, 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 if that's true, I'm very happy to uh, hear that. But one thing that a lot, I'm very proud of is that a lot of professionals use that book in places where they're having wars and children are being traumatized and, uh, you know, uh, kids get their breathing on upside down whenever there's big loud noises. And, you know, it's just a lot of situations in life are making millions of kids grow up with breathing problems. And so um, to the extent that uh, my work can help with that, I'm really grateful. Um, so, what happens is if you get scared, the way human beings are programmed in the old days, back in the cave person days, there would be a saber toothed tiger come running around the corner. Your body would go into fight or flight and you would do one of four things. Either you'd grab some rocks and start pelting the tiger with your other cave person buddies, or you would run like crazy to some place where the cat couldn't get you or the other two adaptations to fear, we talk about fight or flight, but the other two are freeze and faint, more like a collapse, not literally fainting all the time, but just kind of uh, shrinking in your body and kind of the give up thing. And so there's four, we call them around here, the four Fs. Uh, those are all ways of dealing with fear. And all of those in a way put you into fight or flight breathing. And so, the key trick is to begin to notice when you get into that fight or flight breathing and learn to breathe easy again, because here we are millions of years later, and there are some physical threats in life, but compared to the cave person days, there are only a teeny tiny amount of actual physical threats in our daily life. Now, what we have for the past 10, 20,000 years is a buildup of social threats, things like being left behind by the clan, being uh, shamed by other people, uh, uh, being uh, punished for things that we don't have any control over ourselves, being punished unfairly for things. So we've gotten to a place where we have these upper limit problems we apply to ourselves when we start feeling or feeling better or even feeling anxious, we oftentimes cap that off by 
changing the subject or repressing it or some way trying to get away from the organic natural feelings of our bodies. So um, breathing is your first treatment, especially if you're feeling anxious, because here we say fear is excitement without the breath. When you get scared, you hold your breath. <gasps> That's true of every fight or flight situation. If you hear a scary noise, what do you do? <gasps> but we need to learn how to let go of that when the fearsome thought has passed or the fearsome object has moved on. Now we have all these social threats, you know, like I see people, um, oh yeah, a great example. I had a person in here who got more anxious about being criticized by his boss than he got when he crashed his airplane. He told me, you know, he said, well, crashing an airplane, I knew what to do there. I was either going to make it happen or I wasn't going to make it happen. It, it wasn't that big a deal. You know? <laughs> that's kind of, a, that's the kind of guy you want flying your airplane. You know, he's <laughs> kind of guy that thinks, okay, well, this is a problem to be solved. If I can solve it, great. If I can't solve it, okay. Uh, but he said, when my boss is chewing me out, and this is a guy, you know, by the way, he was the vice president of a big company and his boss was the founder. He said, you know, my body doesn't know how to deal with that. I know how to deal with an airplane. But there, you know, it's that issue we talked about earlier, James, the issue of control, that oftentimes we try to resolve issues by trying to control ourselves or control other people to not feel what we're feeling. But what we need to do is learn to have these 10 second little conversations where you actually tell the other person, oh man, I felt hurt when you said that, or oh, I'm feeling scared right now and I'm not sure what to do. You know, those little 10 second, I call them 10 second miracles because uh, that was the name of one of my books because I identified that there are these little 10 second moments of life where we have the opportunity to actually make big leaps forward. And so I, one of the things I say in the new book, The Genius Zone, is that we get dozens and dozens of opportunities every day to jump into our genius zone. And I, I think that uh, I used to miss about 99.9% .9 of those. Now I hope I get a large number. I'm sure I'm missing some still. I recommend that everybody get willing to make their life a, an exploration of genius and then celebrate the stuff that comes up. Yeah, well, that's a great segue into another one of your books that um, is great, Conscious Loving. Uh, oh, yes, uh, thank you. I'm going to bring in my, uh, my wife, Rebecca, who you've mentioned uh, already, and let her uh, take the floor with a few, a few questions. Uh, Hi. <laughs> Hi, how did he recruit you from California? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we met in London, actually. I was I was working here a few years ago. Um, and when I found out that you had agreed to this interview, I said, I have to talk to him. Uh, <laughs> he's been a highly influential person in my life. So thank you for all the work that you've done in putting your own personal story out there and sharing your own uh, journey, you know, to help people with their own lives. Um, it's made a big difference in mine. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. I'm very grateful. That's the best thing you can say to a guy like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I give this book to a lot of my friends. Um, I, I tell them, you know, there's a quote from Carl Jung where he says, if you, I think something like, if you uh, don't identify if you don't let your subconscious become conscious it will rule your life and you'll call it fate um i yes that's one of the most uh, i think i put that out on my instagram one time as the pithiest quote i've ever heard uh, <laughs> you know it, it's it's an absolutely brilliant idea i don't remember the exact word but it's so true i mean if you don't process the stuff that's actually running you <laughs> then you just think life is happening you know and mm -hmm. uh, and it looks like fate is coming at you from every direction and uh yes well that's a big piece of i spend a lot of my time with people rewiring that you know so they understand that 
this is where life is manifesting from, not over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, that's sort of, that's sort of how I would describe the central uh, idea behind conscious loving, which you co-wrote with your wife Kathleen, um, as I understand. Um, yes. Is that how would you uh, introduce our James's uh, viewers and listeners to um, the idea of conscious loving? Yes, well, conscious loving. We used to when we were first going around doing lectures and workshops and things, we used to give away this little um, badge that you wear. It says conscious loving, consider the alternative. So <laughs> let's consider for the moment what unconscious loving is. Okay, what do people most complain about when they exit a relationship? One is, I never felt appreciated. So conscious loving is having the intention to appreciate the other person, having the conscious intention to give appreciation on a regular, meaningful basis to the other person, which means you find out how they like to be appreciated. You find out more about how they, how you can appreciate them. So it becomes a point of focus in your life. That's conscious loving. Another thing, what do people complain about when they exit a relationship, it's often he or she didn't ever tell me the truth, especially about the fact that he was having an affair with his secretary, or especially the fact that she was spending money that she wasn't telling me about. You know, those kinds of things that are in the general subject of integrity in a relationship, having to do with do you speak honestly to the other person? Do you listen consciously? Or do you try to talk them out of what they're feeling? Or do you try to just argue with what they're saying? See, conscious loving is about speaking consciously and listening consciously, because not very many people do, to be honest about it. Uh, you know, that even people that come here for, for counseling in their relationships, that's a very small part of humanity. <laughs> you know, there's not that many people uh, that do that. But what I think needs to happen out in the general world is that we need to, especially teaching in schools, the value of transparency and authenticity. Because you see, if you're not transparent with the world, you're hiding in some way. And I always say to my students, um, and these are all professionals. We don't have, you know, most people come here to our trainings are people that already have a practice practice of some sort or already uh, they might be a medical doctor or a psychologist or a therapist or a life coach or something like that. But they are almost always involved in human transformation in some way. And so they're a pretty select group. But even among that group, it's always amazing to me how poorly trained we are in how to communicate the simplest things in relationship, just how to have a conversation, how to solve a problem without making somebody wrong. Wouldn't that be a great thing if all couples knew how to do that? <laughs> you know, because the default position for many couples is to go into blame immediately when a problem comes up. Well, hey, that's not my problem. That's your, you're the one. And the only thing is the other person never agrees with that point of view. The other person never says, you know, you're right. I am the single cause of all of your life's problems. Darn, I wish I'd thought of that before. You know, we don't uh, look at it like that. We say, wait a minute, who's blaming here? You're the one that's to blame. And so I've literally had couples here that have been having the same argument for 20 or 30 years before we showed them how to stop that argument. And interestingly enough, I've only found one really good way to stop blame. And that is by taking 100% healthy responsibility for whatever the thing is. And if you can get both people to do that, you got yourself a great thriving relationship. Even if they're committed to it, but don't know how to do it well. Katie and I had to you know, we didn't have a self-help book when we started all this. We had to kind of learn it by the seat of our pants. And so it took us years sometimes to learn things that now, because of people having the books and our e-courses and things, you can learn something in an hour that literally took us a year to learn. So that's one of the great 
advantages of living in a communication age is it, is it you know, not everybody can afford a, an expensive trip to uh, Southern California to come here in person. And so I'm, I was very happy over the past year because even though there was terrible things going on in the world, our courses, suddenly people all over the world were taking them because we were offering them on Zoom and video and things like that rather than people having to do them live. And suddenly people are getting up in the middle of the night in Dubai or South Africa or Australia or wherever to take courses that they would have never been able to take before. So that's one of the blessings of the past year in addition to all the horrors of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was glad to hear you mention, you know, education and bringing these concepts into schools, because my next question for you is how, you know, I came into these ideas in my 20s and I really wished that uh, I knew about the concepts of conscious loving and stuff like attachment theory sooner, earlier in my life, because I think it would have saved me a lot of suffering. Um, and. Yeah, I wanted to get your thoughts on how to introduce young people to the idea of, you know, conscious, healthy, romantic relationships in an age-appropriate way that gives them the tools to be empowered to have healthy relationships. Well, there are different ways for different um, levels of, you know, you, when you're dealing with latency age kids, elementary school, basically, um, I don't know how you divide it up over there, but over here, um, people go to elementary school, and then they go to a middle school, um, and then go to a, a secondary school. And um, so, um, you know, high school kids are a real tough crowd, I found. Elementary sc school kids are an easy crowd. They get it like that. Um, and uh, so I've actually, we have a thing uh, that we, uh, that our students have created that are into education. It's called the Conscious Kids Curriculum. And um, you can take a look at it. It's somewhere for on our website somewhere. So, uh, but if you do a search for Conscious Kids Curriculum, uh, you'll see the kinds of things that we value teaching in the early stages. Um, but you have to kind of adapt that to different levels of kids learning because um, something that a first grader can process um, easily Interestingly enough, if you take it into a senior high school class, you know, they, they take forever to process it because they've got so much resistance by then. You know, um, my wife is a movement therapist. Katie uh, was one of the first original dance movement therapists in the country. And um, she was telling me that when kids, before they go to school, they have access to several thousand movements. But by the time they graduate from high school, they're down to only a few hundred movements that their body can do. So the process of education in one way is a process of becoming stupid in another way. Because if we lose 90% of our body movements over a period of sitting in those really comfortable desks for 12 years, um, I don't know who designed the desks in your school, but I think some kind of a, a torture expert designed the ones uh, that I sat in as a kid. And um, so um, there's, a, there's a price that we pay. Um, and same thing with um, communication that we actually, uh, I mean, if you think of the thousands of words that people could learn you know, just think of the thousands of new words that Shakespeare put into the language. Well, by the time people get up into adult life, they're down to about 300 words. I mean, so I don't want that to happen. I want to have more access to stuff when I'm 80 than I do now when I'm only 76. You know, I want to keep opening up more and more and accessing more and more of those as aspects of myself and also learning new things. We found here, we worked with a lot of couples that are um, midlife and up. Uh, midlife is usually defined as 42 to 55 along in there. And so um, we work with a lot of couples because we wrote a book called Conscious Loving Ever After that's designed for couples in midlife and beyond. And one of the things we found, I'll just give you a pre-sample of this. One of the things we found is creativity is super important 
in thriving relationships, both people keeping their creativity flowing. And that's, I think, one of the reasons that Katie and I, you know, we have more fun than I can ever remember us having in our 30s and 40s, you know? And I think it's just because we've lived more life and like Elizabeth Barrett Browning, the poet says, those who breathe most air live most life, you know? So if you make a, a commitment to kind of living a big life and, ah, you know, celebrating it every moment you can, I think that's uh, one of the key things in keeping a relationship thriving. Uh, by the way, um, I've got uh, people scratching at my door here, waving signs at me that say, I got to go do this on another location here. Uh, so I'm going to have to wrap this up uh, pretty sure. quickly. Sure. And uh, so any last minute uh, things you'd like to ask well, me about gosh. before I turn yeah. into a pumpkin and leave? Sure. Um, I guess we have one sort of wrap up question, which is, uh, I think of you as someone who has it all figured out, but paradoxically also, uh, is the kind of person who's always working on themselves, always growing. So I just, I wanted to know um, if there are still things that you are discovering about yourself, about relationships um, and epiphanies that you are still having and maybe what your ongoing practice is like. Well, yes, I, I have insights all the time about my own relationships. In fact, this morning I was meditating. Oh, that's another thing I do every day. I meditate twice a day. I learned TM way back 50 years ago, and I've been doing that twice a day ever since and um, really value it tremendously because it's like a little 20 some minute period of time in the morning of getting myself really still before I start working. And then at the end of the day, kind of getting myself like taking a shower at the end of the day, you know, getting my mind showered up for the evening. But anyway, I was meditating this morning and I had an insight about something that's going on with my um daughter who's uh, around 50 and uh, lives up in the Bay Area and uh, about my relationship with her. And so, um, you know, I think we need to stay open to these things all the time. I want to be learning. I want to be learning stuff about my breathing when I take my last one. And so uh, that, uh, I think, well, here we use a thing. We have a 20 point openness to learning scale we use with executives and that kind of thing. And uh, the higher you can go toward a 10, being very open to just learning from life, not defending yourself. You know, when you can go through life that way, and when you can go into relationship that way, real magic can happen. Well, thank you again, Kay. This has been wonderful. Um, you know, you've really made a big difference to both of us. And I really appreciate you putting you know, all this, this positive stuff out there in the world. Um, I'm sure Rebecca feels the same way. Yeah, it's wonderful to meet one of our heroes. Yeah. So thank you so much for taking the time. Well, blessings to you. Thank you for spreading the word. And uh, I'll come back on sometime and do a whole one on the uh, the new book. We'd love uh, that. Great. But thanks for also bringing up Conscious Loving. Now, that was the one we were first on Oprah with and that kind of thing. So uh, I, that's such an important book in my life, but almost nobody brings it up anymore because it came out 30 <laughs> years ago. So thanks for introducing it to a new crowd definitely it's definitely still relevant yeah thank yeah. you thank you